I saw a very interesting grassroots innovation was when I did a volunteer work in Lao Cai Province, North Vietnam. How to get there takes about eight hours by train from Hanoi, and then another two hours by land. And then we had to traverse Mount Fansipan, which is the highest mountain in Indochina, to set up a camp, which is going to be our dwelling for the next three weeks. And there I saw a very amazing piece of machinery. Now this machine is built by the villagers themselves. It creates rice noodles, which is the staple food of the Hmong people, which is the name of the tribe in the northern part of Vietnam. But what's fascinating about that machine is it's made out of rudimentary recyclable material, but the impact is that it has brought the entire community. It's what's remarkable about it. Just imagine a very basic, simple machine feeds the entire community population of 80 households. It has brought the family of that community 50% savings because they no longer have to pay for public transportation just to get to the nearest town to buy themselves rice noodles. They can create it themselves. And aside from that, it has brought them 25% in revenue because they can sell the excess rice noodles right in the public market. And that's what I'm going to share with you for today. We're going to explore the creative process that went through to each and every individual's organizations, trying to find the inspiration to generate innovations, practical solutions from the most unlikely places during the most unlikely event, trying to embrace the unexpected. So again, I'm Aisa. I am an engineer by profession and I thought I was going to be a corporate engineer for the next 30, 40 years of my life. But it wasn't too long ago when I decided to become an NGO worker. And now I am a founder of an impact-based social enterprise trying to address the light inequality gap in the Philippines by way of a lantern that makes use of the most abundant natural resource that we have, which is salt water enough to generate electricity to power up LEDs and even charge low power mobile devices like your cell phones and smartphones. And it's actually quite recently that I'm starting to realize that SALT, which is my organization, it stands for Sustainable Alternative Lighting, is actually a culmination of two opposing fields that I allowed myself to be involved in. One, being an engineer, and the other, being a social worker. So yes, I'm from the Philippines, and before I continue, can I get a show of hands as to how many of you have visited my country before? Okay, quite a few. I guess our Department of Tourism needs to push a little further when it comes to promoting the country. But as you all know, Philippines is our archipelago. We are situated in the Southeast Asian region. We have more than 7,000 islands, increases when it's low tide, decreases when it's high tide. <laughs> Um, we are a developing economy with a growing population of more than 100 million. I believe so. Philippines is also a wealthy country or should have been a wealthy country because we are blessed with rich natural resources. Unfortunately, due to our political culture and slow economic development, many of our people are still experiencing real-world problems ranging from lack of access to clean water, power greed, sanitation, housing, education. But what's fascinating about being a Filipino is that despite having 25% of our population living under the poverty line, we are still considered as one of the 10 happiest nations in the world. <laughs> According to a year-end poll, we were able to retain the third spot with a plus 84 happiness score in the 10 happiest nations in the world as of 2018. And I guess it, it is because of this attitude, aside from having an enriched cultural background, creativity, strong entrepreneurial spirit, that we find opportunities in addressing poverty and generating uh, practical solutions, which generated more than a million small, medium enterprises, 30,000 of which are social enterprises, including mine. 
So it was in 2013 when the Philippines was struck by the largest typhoon ever recorded in history, Typhoon Haiyan. As, and as you can see from the picture, you cannot even see Philippines on the map because it's covered by this image of the typhoon. That's how massive Typhoon Haiyan was. And it killed around 6,000 people and destroyed 4 million homes, particularly in the city of Tacloban. Now, Tacloban is an urbanized area located in the eastern part of the Philippines. And it is where a young creative idealist birthed an innovation that will give Tacloban a, a sort, some sort of a livelihood, some sort of a start for families who lost their loved ones and homes from the typhoon. Now, Taklob, which is the name of the organization, it's a native language that means cover, is a bag brand made from upcycled Japanese tarpaulin and pre-loved jeans from here, from Germany that can turn into a floating device in case of flooding and can potentially save lives, particularly the lives of the children. So how it works? You just have to fill the bag with eight to 10 soda bottles. One soda bottle filled with air will give you the same buoyant force as an equal weight of water. So one gallon would give you around 8.3 pounds. So five gallons would give you around 41.5 pounds, that's 18 to 20 kilos, enough to carry and lift five to eight-year-old children. And what was the main impact of this? It's not giving livelihood. It's not just giving livelihood. What was the main impact of the club among the people who were victimized by the typhoon? It's giving the people hope the sense of security after experiencing the most devastating typhoon ever recorded in history. And it is because of that, that this social enterprise, this bad brand, their innovation won several design awards locally and internationally, even won the most prestigious design award in my country. So going back to the city, we have a place we call Payatas. Now, Payatas is the largest open dump site for all the cities, including the capital of the Philippines, which is Manila. And it is home to, yeah, you, you heard it right, it is home to 120,000 people, most of which get their livelihood from scavenging garbage in this 13.5 hectare landfill. And it is where a young student who immersed herself trying to understand the daily challenges of the people living there, that she founded Rags to Riches. Now, what is Rags to Riches? From the term itself, Rags to Riches, what is she trying to do? What she's trying to do is she's trying to connect the mothers, particularly the mothers of Payatas, who are weaving foot rags directly to the textile industry to get textile clippings at a cheaper price instead of buying them from the middlemen, which is what they usually do, who get 70% of their earnings. But she did, she did not just stop there. What did she do? She also got a help from one of the leading popular fashion designer in the Philippines to turn these rags, these foot rags, into this. Designer bags, purses, and accessories. And it is now a thriving business. And because of this, she was able to help transform the lives of more than 1,000 artisans in the Philippines, most of which are now able to send their children to school. Some are even have already have the capacity to go out of the landfill, to go out of the dump site, to find a more decent and livable home. And this initiative, <laughs> this initiative has caught even the attention of Amal Clooney, which is a very popular uh, human rights lawyer, the wife of George Clooney, and she's now uh, helping them promote the brand across the world. And what was the main impact of this social enterprise? Again, it's not about giving livelihood to the people. 
what did she give the mothers of Payata? She gave them pride. She gave them dignity that the mothers are now able to find joy in weaving foot rags because they now understand that what they're doing has value. That was the main impact that was brought by rags to riches to these mothers. So talking about designer uh, brands, there's another social enterprise in the Philippines that was born out of the most unconve unconventional places. So Risque Design, which is the name of the social enterprise, the founder of Risque Design, what did she do? She just connected all of these three places together with the dyeing industry. What do I mean by the dyeing industry? There's this place called Marikina City. Now Marikina City is a well known, well known for their shoe. Uh, shoemaking industry. Another place is uh, we have Paete Laguna, which is very well known for carving, particularly religious images. And last but not least, we have a province we call Kalinga, which is located in the northern part of the Philippines, which, is, uh, which are very well known for their weaving. Dyeing industry, the reason for that is because of globalization. A lot of manufactured products have flocked the country since the 90s, and it greatly affected all of this business together. And what she did, she combined all of this dying industries together to create this. Now, these are not shoes. These are work of art for me. As you can see from the sole of the shoe, that's carved by the Paete Laguna carvers. And then what she used as a textile is the one that was made by the tribal people of Kalinga. And that this is assembled by the experts shoemaking in Marakina City. And now they're a thriving industry. This is also being sold in Paris, France. Uh, the, the Risque Design brand is now being uh, sold in the shops of Paris, France. That's a totally uh, like a large fit for such a social enterprise coming from the Philippines. So, what was the main social? What was the main impact that Risque Designs brought the community? Again, it's not just saving the dying business. The main impact of this is saving and preserving a hundred-year-old culture and tradition. That was the social impact Risque Design was able to bring to the community and society of the Philippines. So last example that I have is that, um, as we all know, Philippines is an agriculture, agricultural country. Unfortunately, most of the farmers in the Philippines don't have the capacity to support them, their farms. So they don't have capital in general. So what these students did is they developed a crowdfunding platform focused on farmers. So even if you are from Germany, you can invest in a farm of your choosing with as low as 100 US dollars. And that will give you 100% uh, guarantee return. Why? Because the organizers of this crowdfunding plat platform doesn't just give the farmers the capital they need, they also help the farmers market their products. They have so many partners for the farmers to, uh, of course, for, to help the farmers market their products. And what was the main social impact that was given by Cropital among the farmers? Again, it's not just about the capital. The main social impact here is giving the farmers focus to do their job. Focus to just grow the crops, focus to just increase the yield. And what, what was the main impact? Because of capital, the rural farmers in the Philippines was able to increase the crop yield up to 80% only because of this platform. And they are now able to help 20,000 farmers for the next five years. So talking about my venture, Talking about my venture, I had the same experiences, creative process. I have, I have gone through the same creative process that, uh, of those founders that I just mentioned before. So when I founded my own social enterprise, which is so, named SALT, it stands for Sustainable Alternative Lighting, what we do is we devised a material that when you submerge in a saline solution or seawater, that would generate enough power for you to light up LEDs and even charge low power mobile devices like your cell phones and smartphones. And how was I able to think about that was because of this. When I visited 
a small rural, rural village in Kalinga, that's a rural, uh, that's, a no, that's a mountainous part, northern, northern part of the Philippines. As you can see, the village literally sits on top of the mountain. They don't have access to electricity. Most of them are using kerosene lantern. And I lived there for quite some time, enough for them to baptize me with a tribal name. So just to give you a brief, brief background of what the village is, uh, is about, I'm not sure if you have seen a documentary about this particular uh, place, because quite recently, uh, this place have gone viral all over social media because of her. Not sure if you've seen her, but she is a well-known last Kalinga tattoo artist. And I was fortunate enough to get marked by her, not just once, but twice. But I tell you, it hurts like hell. <laughs> so just to, uh, just to uh, explain a little more about her uh, tradition, her craft, what she's using mainly as a ink is coal soot drenched in coconut oil, and then pomelo tree torn as the needle stuck in between a bamboo stick. And then as she hand tap on your skin, she's 97 years old, mind you. Sometimes she uncontrollably puncture your skin deeply enough for you to, <laughs> to have like a, your, <laughs> your mind goes blank. But uh, really, uh, she's the last Kalinga tattoo artist. And the experience, the unusual experience that I had in this tribe actually nourished my creativity skills. So what I'm trying to say uh, is there are many things in life that you will never learn in the four corners of your classroom or of your office. You have to go out there and experience the rawness of life. Allow yourself to make unusual experiences from these unconventional places. And you'll be surprised of how much creativity you have within you. Like, for example, how would you survive traveling with only $10 in your pocket? That takes creativity. It'll make you resourceful, it'll make you st strategic, and it'll make you humble. And uh, with, this uh, with this type of experiences, I was able to found my social enterprise, and now our technology is being distributed across the Philippines that would help 2.4 million people who are not still connected to the power grid. And hopefully, hopefully, we're able to distribute this as well to the 1.2 billion people who are not connected to the power grid across the world. Thank you for listening, and may you have a wonderful afternoon.